and it is my pleasure to welcome you all here to this event celebrating Joanna Biggs. Um, you can clap for that. Um, in addition to being the editor of Harper's, I am also a member of the Writer's Studio here. So the Harper's offices and the Center for Fiction are the two places other than my own home where I spend the most time. So uh, this partnership feels very special to me. Um, for those of you who don't know the Center for Fiction, you are in it. Um, for those of you who don't know Harper's Magazine, it is America's longest continuously running monthly magazine, and I think you've all gotten copies of it, and I urge you to check it out. Um, I have been tasked with some housekeeping here. There will be audience Q&A tonight. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand, and someone will come around with a microphone so that the guests on our live stream can hear. If you are watching via YouTube, you may type your question at any time in the chat. When the event is over, you may purchase books in the bookstore and find Joe right outside these doors on the other side of the bookstore. Um, and with that, um, Joanna Biggs is um, an editor at Harper's Magazine, previously an editor at the London Review of Books. She has written for The New Yorker, The Financial Times, The Guardian, The Sunday Times, and much more. She is going to be in conversation with Lauren Euler and Christine Smallwood. Lauren Euler is a critic and novelist based in Berlin. Her writing appears regularly in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The London Review of Books, and of course, Harper's Magazine. The issue you all have uh, features Lauren's dispatch from the Goop Cruise, which was edited by, uh, by Joe. Um, and finally, um, Christine Smallwood is a novelist and critic and a longtime Harper's uh, contributor and, and for a while the Harper's New Books columnist. And she is the author of the novel, The Life of the Mind. So please welcome to this stage, Joanna Biggs, Lauren Euler, and Christine Smallwood. so much for coming. Um, a real pleasure to see a full room. Women writers, woo! <laughs> I think we're going to start with Joe reading a portion of the book. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read from the opening of the chapter on Sylvia Plath. So the book is um, Life of One's Own, Nine Women, writers, Nine Women Writers Begin Again, and it's eight chapters, it's eight essays. It starts with Mary Wollstonecraft and ends with Elena Ferrante. And Plath was actually where I started writing, um, but this is, an, this is a new beginning to this chapter. Sylvia. Four Augusts after I was divorced, I went on a holiday on Newcomb Hollow Beach on Cape Cod where Sylvia Plath had spent her platinum summer of 1954. Not just gold, but platinum. She had survived a suicide attempt the previous August, and what better summer than the one you thought you'd never see? Lydia had come with me to the Cape. We had no vehicle, and so on our last day, we walked to the beach on the weed-grown verge under cover of pine trees, often in single file to avoid fast cars. Eventually, we emerged onto the edge of this tendril of Massachusetts, where Plath had spent some of her happiest and freest times. The sun was sinking, and the sky was pink where it met the sea, rising up through tangerine, lemon, and pistachio to an ever darker blue. We let loose our hair, we took off our shoes, we allowed the edge of the waves to foam over our toes. We'd heard there were sharks, so even this contact with the waters of Cape Cod Bay felt daring. The late summer day had been hot. I was fresh at last. I could not see where the beach ended. We've developed many myths about Sylvia Plath since her death by suicide in 1963, but she had myths about herself too. She invented Lady Lazarus, who ex executed her comeback in broad day to shouts of a miracle. She gave life to Esther Greenwood, whose stay in an asylum lifts her depression enough to hear the old brag of my heart, I am, I am, I am. On her 30th birthday, Plath imagined herself riding through the Devon landscape on a horse, shedding dead hands, dead stringencies, 
and announcing, I am the arrow. Both her novel, The Bell Jar, and Ariel, a collection of poems she completed before her death, are as much about rising again as they are about oblivion. She'd intended Ariel to start on the word love and end on the word spring. And when her husband, Ted Hughes, as her accidental executor, reordered the collection for publication after her death, removing some poems he didn't like and promoting those he did, a parade of mythic women, ones who survive, ones who protest, ones who defy, vanished. When I returned to Sylvia Plath's writing while I was trying to work out why my marriage ended, I discovered another Sylvia. I'd got married in pink, partly under the influence of her, partly because my mother had also married, though not knowing or caring about Plath, in a pink knitted dress in 1977. Both Sylvia and my mother had borrowed outfits from their mothers. I had felt cowed, dazzled, overawed, scared, amazed by the woman writer I'd first read at 17, before I'd even had my first serious boyfriend. I liked my life to touch hers. Then, I would, and I do still, stop by her far last flat in Fitzroy Road when I'm in Primrose Hill and look up at once what was once her window. I wanted so much to claim her that I find myself mounting the argument that she was English because she wrote her best work in London and Devon. But I also read her again because I suspected that something in me, some wrong idea I'd nursed, had started with her. I began with her first known letter and followed the thread chronologically through the journal the poems, the fiction as she wrote them. And this time around, her efforts to rise again seemed clearer to me. Her interest in the arts of living well, cooking, dressing, sewing, painting, were part of this, as were the poems she sent right back out again when they were rejected. I discovered Sylvia the Divorcee, someone I hadn't known existed, right there between Sylvia the Wife and Sylvia the Depressive. I discovered something else too. Oh. <laughs> that her myth had less hold over me than it once did. Don't worry, it's nearly over. Um, <laughs> there was something so sad about her life. It felt juvenile now, stupid even, to be taking a mid-century American woman's concerns as my own. Her intensity had not always served her well, and she'd exhausted herself trying so much harder than she needed to. She was bad at female friendship because everyone was a rival, and I wanted my life to feel easier less like I was trying to live up to some impossible ideal. And Plath couldn't help me with that. Okay, so um, just to say a bit more about this um, wonderful book, um, it's, as we know, a life of one's own. It's organized into eight chapters, each around a different writer, and there are um, Joe's reflections about her own life, marriage, and divorce kind of woven through each of those eight chapters. Um, and I remember being very excited when I saw this book was coming out because I have such tremendous admiration for Joe as a literary critic. Um, and so I want to start by asking two questions. One is just how did this book come about? What is its origin story? And two, how were writing these chapters different than writing the kind of review essays that I think everyone in the room is probably really familiar with. Can you go out, Christine, you feel the same about you too, that's why it's lovely to have you both here. Um, so I subscribe to this theory of the accidental autobiography of pieces. And if you come across this or whether it was a London thing, um, I, when I started to know the writers and work with them, I would see that every essay was sort of, the things they were interested in each work of art, the book, the movie, the play, was something that would happening to them in their real life. And um, I think as I wrote more and more, I would often try and bring that out, or I'd try it out in my own way. And so this book came from those experiments, from um, trying it. The first essay was this plus one I wrote in 2018. It's been through a lot of stuff in my life, and I would just try adding it to the criticism. Plath is someone I'd read, as I said, from when I was 17, my whole life. I cared about her so much, a huge, two volume letters came out and I wanted to write about them, so it was, it was all of that. Also, I realized I, I was gonna do a PhD when I was 24, and it was gonna be a history of women's writing that started from 
um, Afroban, who was sort of shameless and open, to um, Carabelle, who's Charlotte Bronte, who obviously didn't even put this under her own name. And I wanted to trace that. And I wonder if there's some of that in here, starting the 18th century and ending, right, with Elena Ferrante. Um, so, yeah. And um, who are the authors that you thought about including that didn't make it into this book? Um, it's hard to choose eight. It's really, really hard. In fact, I, my, one of my closest friends from London who's not here told me to choose seven because it's a lucky number, but I couldn't even <laughs> choose seven. Um, so I sometimes worry, wonder why I didn't include Austen and Bronte because they fit perfectly in here and they're part of the English canon and they're part of the tradition. Um, you have to choose somewhere, and I think um, it was really important to me to include writers of colour and to have that discussion happening in the book. It was really important to come right back up to now. And yeah, no, I did think about including, and this morning I was like, ah, oh, I should have. I mean, I didn't know she was going to get the Nobel. It was an amazing <laughs> moment. But I had an essay about her that I thought actually could have fit, and she fits really, really well with Beauvoir. Like, we probably all know this, but um, Erno sent her first novel to Beauvoir, and Beauvoir wrote her a letter back. And so that interaction was really important for Erno because she's a working class writer in France, and Beauvoir is like the most kind of like bourgeois, bohemian, kind of fancy French writer. Um, yeah, and I was, when I, I read the book twice, and I, the second time I was really noticing how you talk about how you're putting to the book together and how you're structuring it as you're sort of writing the essay. So you're sort of narrating both the writer's life that you're focusing on, also things that are happening in your life, and also sort of your ideas about um, writing and as they're forming. And a lot of that is talking about how there's a sort of taboo or a sort of resistance to this kind of criticism, which is both um, personal as in you, but also sort of biographical as in you're talking about, kind of kind of flagrantly a little bit, like you're relating, not, not in a bad way, uh, <laughs> you're relating um, what's happening in the, in the author's fiction or poetry to what's happening in their life when they're writing it. Mm. Um, and you write about how you learned not to do that, and I'm wondering how you unlearned not to do that. Um. Part of it was that little bit of rebellion, I think. Mm -hmm. That little bit of um, uh, what my teachers told me and what at Oxford and what I wanted to try and do in the world. I it took me a long time. I didn't have the confidence to do it when I started. Um, hopefully, none of you will go back and read my first reviews, but they are very kind of focused on the book. They're very focused on, and they I don't talk about myself as much. Um, and I, I guess I started to think that there was a lot of lot lost if you didn't do that. There was a lot lost if you didn't know that Beauvoir came from where Erno comes from, um, that there were things that couldn't happen. And that also with this accidental autobiography theory, I was like, well, I'm not being honest about what's going on with me. Like, why with Plath am I interested in these moments in her life? Like the, the set of letters that she exchanges with Ted Hughes when they're married in secret but not living together and what's going on in those. That's the one where she says, um, she says to Ted, oh, that person should love being raped from the floor. Like, there's like a lot of interesting weird shit going on there. And um, I was, my marriage was ending and I was thinking about all those things. So I started to think, well, that was more honest. I, well, how do you two, because you both write amazing criticism, do you two feel that that's something that you play with or want to avoid or? Um, I just want to be careful about it, right? <laughs> so I think like, I try not to just like do a transition that's like, this, reading this made me sad, right? Like that's not that interesting. Um, but if there's, when I'm writing criticism, I don't want it to be like a term paper, right? Mm. And so I'm constantly like trying to figure out ways to make it um, feel more like a piece of writing or a piece of literature or, or art. Um, mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, a work of journalism or a work that, like a sort of para-academic text. Um, and I think there's, a, there's, you write in the book, the thing that you always want to read is like what's going on in their life, right? And the thing that you, <laughs> the thing that I always want to read about is the writer's life, even though I know that it's sort of naughty. Um, 
uh, but also you have to balance it with uh, revealing too much about yourself or, or um, embarrassing yourself in some way. And I wondered if you were nervous to talk so much about your personal life. Uh, well, I don't actually. From, from not, not because you're committing like an academic faux pas, <laughs> but like because you're like, oh no, I'm talking about my divorce. Um, <laughs> I don't actually worry too much. There's not actually a huge amount. There is a bit of me in there, but it, I haven't told everything. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. I was and, quite disappointed um, <laughs> in that. I was hoping for sex scenes. Um, <laughs> and, um, and also, I was, I was worried about that, not for the reason you say, which is a brilliant reason to be worried about it. I was worried about it because I... Um, I'd written about my mother, a straight memoir, a piece about my mother, and I had a very weird reaction to that. I thought it was going to feel like a, memori a good memorial to her, but actually what it felt like is um, it felt like finally seeing... Someone could read the decline of my mother from... So my mother died from Alzheimer's last year, around this time, um, and she'd been ill for eight years before that. And the beginning of the piece, my mother is... My mother, in the end, she is... She's gone, and... Someone could read that in 10 minutes and come up to me and say, I was, you know, maybe, maybe sad, are you okay? And I, um, th that realization of what I was gone through and how hard it was um, just pushed me like, over the edge. I was like, I you know, ran to the doctors and got depression, um, antidepressants, which, you know, and so I was more scared of that. I was more scared of like, the effect it might have on my life. Um, and, you know, there's, I really care about being a good like daughter and I'm being very earnest now, daughter and friend and whatever and aunt and I didn't want to be around for that. So it's more like that effect as opposed to actually the effect on my writing. You mean you're afraid that it would offend other people in your life or No, cause... no, no, because I, no, no. Or, or you're afraid that it wouldn't do justice? Well, I, I usually share stuff with people that I care about yeah. um, and, I'm, uh, and make sure they're okay with it. and. Uh, I also, yeah, it was more like, yeah, what what would be the effect be generally <laughs> on, on whether I could continue? Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Can you can you say a little bit more about why women writers, and like you know the whole frame of the book as if yeah. they're all they're all women writers and like what does that mean to you and and what's empowering or liberating about that as a framework or why yeah. you were drawn to it? Um. I guess because I like to know my traditions that I'm working in, I guess. And I know it's called a life of one's own. It's not because it's not a bettering of Wolf, but I, that essay, A Room of One's Own, does set a lot of the terms of the discussion of how we, what we do with that, whether we, she talks about that famous passage of we all must let laurels lie on, on those tombs in Westminster Abbey because we need to know what our traditions are and what we're doing with them. Basically, a lot of problems they've solved already, <laughs> some of these women writers, and if yeah. we don't know how to solve those problems, then we can't go further. And also, we don't know the possibilities of it. I suppose if this book, one of the things I want this book to do for a reader is open up their sense of what's possible. Um, I grew up in the suburbs. My parents were married my whole life. Like I, there's lots of things I didn't see, these bohemian sorts of people I never saw in real life. So it's trying to open that up and keep that keep a space open to like make mistakes, to do wrong things, to try things out that don't work, to, you know, all of that, I guess. Do you want to give an example from the book for, for people who haven't read it yet? Like, what is, what's the kind of unconventional thing or the kind of opened up thing that you learned from these other women? Yeah. Um, well, Simone de Beauvoir is just a great example of that, that she, um, she decided from a young age that she wanted to be an intellectual, and that meant that meant not getting married, even though she met Sartre, and he asked her, and she said no. Um, and it meant being able to take lovers if she wanted to. It meant structuring her life around writing. So it was this kind of period after the war in France where she did most of her writing, where she would go, she'd be in the hotel in the morning, smoke, coffee, write till about 11, have lunch. Lunch finishes at like four, I think, It's Paris. <laughs> goes back to rise a bit more and then goes back out to the bar at like 11. So that sort of life, I mean, I work in an office every day and my boss is here, but um, <laughs> I, um, that sort of life is like a way of structuring your life around like friends and writing and all of that is, um, is exciting to me. And I, it was, you know, my, I didn't see any of, you know, I didn't see that growing up in the suburbs. 
Yeah, what do you think are the, so to structure, I think in the book you talk a lot about finding a new shape for your life, finding a new form for your life. Mm. Um, and I wonder, like, like, is that, does Simone de Beauvoir have a structure because she has a, a regimen that she often breaks because she's like traveling, she's going to see, she's mm. going to see Nelson, boyfriend, <laughs> boyfriend number two. Uh, and like, she, you know, I'm wondering like, what is the relationship between the freedom that you're always talking about that women write, like we're all sort of seeking, like we all want more freedom mm. um, and the kind of like rules and things you have to set out as a writer in order to get your writing done, right? Yeah, I think she has a great answer for this, but she doesn't actually go around and give it, but I'm just gonna give it because it's actually quite easy, straightforward thing. <clears throat> so her last book of um, memoirs is structured, the chapters are all structured by <coughs> parts of her life. So it's like her friends, her lovers, um, travel, her writing, and basically it's those elements that you need to like mix up in the right proportions each time, family, all those things. Um, and freedom is always gonna be like the freedom to change your mind, isn't it? The freedom to like change course, freedom to say I'm wrong, and to not to feel that you're backed into a corner. The freedom to divorce, frankly, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, the freedom to have an abortion, all those things, like to change your course and move through your life, I think. Um, yeah, and I think one of the interesting things about the book is that freedom doesn't necessarily seem appealing always, given how difficult it is. You know, I mean, it's like the, the, the moments of your life that you weave in, you're incredibly frank and about, you know, unhappiness or depression or really kind of difficult transitions in and after the divorce. So, yeah, it's, it's funny about freedom. I know, you see, you think it's great and then you get a lot of it and you think, mm. Yeah, but if you didn't have it, I don't know. Or you, you would be like, I hate this, I hate this, I hate this, I must get it away. I mean, I'm sure you've experienced this, you had a divorce, I have to get this off. And then it, you're like, it isn't, as, it isn't perfect, but I think a lot, I don't know, I find a lot of decisions that I make are just about like erasing the desire to do whatever it is that I wanted to do, and which is, becomes almost limiting, right? Like, I don't really know if you feel the same way or how you think about like, what you want to do in your life. Um, but so much of it is like, I feel the, the biggest pressure on me as a person and as a writer is like within my own mind. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, I totally agree, and that is what Wolf said basically. She was like, we always gone about room one's own if it's, if it's the room of one's own, but it's not, it's not. It's the room one's own, lock on the door, amount of money. But actually the whole essay is about all the things that when you have that room, when you have that lock, when you have that money, you still can't write the things that you need to get away and out through, find ways around. And um, yeah, so I feel exactly like that. There's, um, I was reading the end of the novel of love by Ruben Gornick and she, that's really important to her, this idea of freedom too. And she has this, I mean, I guess it's what we've said, but she says, um, free is not through the working mind or the gratified senses, Free through the steady application of self-understanding, which I guess means this doesn't work for me. I've got to try something else, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there's such an emphasis on uh, friendship and, and sociality in the book. You know, at the last chapter, the Elena Fronte chapter, like hinges on this party where you have all of these friends come together and kind of sharing that experience. Do you want to say something about that moment or what that party meant to you? Uh, yeah, no, it was a big deal that thing it was sort of improvised and bad like I didn't cook I just ordered pizza and um, I just made cocktails from what I had um, but it, it did mean a lot to bring women together around these other books at this particular moment in my life and um, I have a tape of it somewhere really we taped it thinking like oh, we're doing something <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was this moment as well of I, I think I Wrote about in the book, but I was writing a review of the last um, volume, and I really didn't. Everyone was reading them. Everyone was reading them. It was like I would go to the pub, and someone would be wouldn't even come in the pub because they were outside finishing the chapter before they would come and meet you. It was like that level of. Um, so it, maybe it's antisocial, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it really meant a lot to me to have that conversation around something else. Um, and yeah, those people are still really important to me. 
Can we go back to your question about what, why women writers? Yeah. And um, can I add, why, what is the relationship between women writing about their personal lives um, and uh, sort of sociality? And, and like, and I, we, you know, we know, but maybe you can sort of gloss for the audience, like why that has traditionally been the case and why are we still attached to it now, I think. Like, why are you drawn to these women writers' love lives? Like, why are we, like, drawn to hear about your divorce and, like, to blend in this kind of way that you're doing? Because I'm drawn to it as well, obviously. Um, are we, like, trying to make friends? Do you feel like we have to come say? Um, I guess what the, maybe the better question is, what's wrong with men that they're not? <laughs> <laughs> um, some of them are, right? They're, they do. <laughs> they try. <laughs> They're foiled at every turn. I just sometimes feel I haven't experienced something if I haven't had a friend to tell somehow. Mm -hmm. okay, great. Um, and it's not just like I want to narrate, but it's almost like the, my life exists in that space between them and me. Um, and I'm feeling I can, yeah, I remember feeling I can like therapy, like the, the important thing, obviously, the, when you go to therapy, the important thing is the relationship, not the actual, that they can't tell you what to do. Um, uh, and it takes you a long time to learn that, and you work out that it's that thing between that's important. You, there's one of the reasons I really love Zora is that she, The Rise of Watching God is about that relationship, the relationship she has with different people and like how that, what she learns from that and how that she can apply that to her next one. And I think, yeah, I just sort of think that's where life is. Well, and there's a conversation in the book that you're having with your past solves and your past reading solves too, like in the chapter on Eliot and Middlemarch, you talk about how different your reading of Dorothea is now than it was mm -hmm. the first time you read it. Um, do you want to say anything about that? It's funny how that changes. I, I yeah, um, I suppose there's lots of people here have read that book several times too, and maybe you, lot, you two have too, but they, I started off with Dorothea thinking, my God, how can she marry that dude? That's awful. How can she think that that's the way of doing things? And then reading it again, reading about Casabon, this kind of older academic in the book he's writing. And there's something so very moving about him. He's sort of been caught up in his writing for so long and suddenly turns around and thinks, oh, I, oh maybe I should fall in love or marry someone. What would that be like? And then he does it and he's like, oh, I haven't got really the capacity. Elliot calls it like a shallow rill, you know, <laughs> like that he just doesn't yeah. really, he can't really do it. Um, and then he knows there's a whole area of life that he'll never have. And luckily he dies soon, so he doesn't have to like, live with it for too long. <laughs> big but, spoiler, um, Joe. That was a big spoiler. If anybody here has a little mark. Just, um, can we delete that from the YouTube or something? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm terrible with spoilers. I, it's being a literary critic and never being able to give away the plot. I sort of love being able to discuss things when you can discuss the end. Because a lot of meaning is in the ending. I don't know. Yeah, I, oh, I totally agree. And yeah. I also think like you can't. Like the, you can't, I don't know, so often lately I'm thinking in terms of comeuppance for some reason. And, <laughs> and like, you can't interpret the beginning of a book unless you know, and this is a very sort of basic plot thing, but like, you can't, you can't say, oh, this is a bad character, you know, the, the sort of way people do critic like sort of popular criticism now, like, this is a bad character, this character is unlikable. But mm -hmm. if you don't read to the end of the book, you don't know what the author has done with the bad character, right? Mm -hmm. Like, some, some characters are truly bad, right? Like, immoral. Um, but sometimes you're, it, yeah, I agree with you. Anyway. <laughs> no, it, it drives me crazy and you can't, yeah, yeah anyway. Um, do you feel that sometimes when you're reading that you'll come across your old self? And I, yeah. I was really like, ooh, Joe. I mean, the worst, the the worst is happen. when you, you're old marginalia and you're just like, yikes, yeah, I'm yeah, going to yeah. erase this. <laughs> <laughs> These, I, I especially had a tendency in college to write very kind of sarcastic things in my books that mm. now, you know, 20 years later, I try not to do that as much. <laughs> yeah, but I really loved uh, where you land on Dorothea, um, just this idea that a life can have so much value, you know, regardless of its public achievements. I think is such, a, it's such like that's like the heart of Middle March, you know. Yeah, but it's right at the end. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing. Yeah. It really, really is. Um, yeah, 
Do you feel that too? Would you reread, or do you? Oh, it's I apart from how to my, read my book twice. But. Yeah, well, I re I reread a bunch of stuff last summer, um, and what was interesting for me was I re read all this. I basically think it's pointless to read. I mean, you should. It's, it's Where not, is the sentence going? <laughs> I think it's point. It's basically pointless. It's not pointless, but you can't count anything you read before you're like 24 because you have no idea what's 40. Oh my god, you have no idea what's going on. You don't remember any of it. You like maybe remember like a vague aura or whatever. So that's a whole degree. <laughs> yeah, your whole degree. Like maybe like if you're serious, like you can start when you're 24. I don't know when you should start. Um, but like I just remember like. I read all this stuff when I was 19, and then I went back and read it now, and I was like, there's no way I understood what that was about. Do you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I think it's important, but I also think like, uh, and you probably have this as well, when, because a lot in this book, you sort of say, oh, someone gave this to me. Your mother gave you a couple of books that you never read. Mm. And then you read them when you're like 37 or something. Mm. And you're like, oh, now I see why she gave me this maybe and what would my life had been like if I'd read it but also I think the inverse of that is that you see the weird influences that you picked up in your own writing from things that you read when you're a teenager even if you can't actually remember any of what is in the book mm -mm. does that do you find like what who would you say is the most influential for you of these writers as in like who do you emulate or like think about when you're actually like putting words on the page, or what you would like your writing to be mm. most like? Is it that right? Right? Like you're not sort of mm. emul no one's emulating anyone if you're serious, which we all are. Um, <laughs> um, the person who I find liberating when I'm stuck is is Beauvoir because weirdly because she didn't always write that perfectly. And when I'm really struggling, I think, oh God, it was fine. She didn't. <laughs> lots of, she wrote amazing things, and she got her ideas out even when she. Um, but no, I really like to write beautiful, lasting things like Toni Morrison has. You know, like I, I um, you know, this is hopefully just a start, and I can write something better next time. <laughs> Who's your favorite? We were talking. We already know who your favorite is. We just talked about it backstage, but they don't know. I can't change it now. No. You can change it, but you have to. I think it's more valuable to say what comes to your mind because my, I have a favorite as well, but it doesn't make sense. Okay, well then we all have to share our favorites. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't agree to that. <laughs> it's not a democracy. It's a cheerocracy. <laughs> um, mine is Plath. I, like I just, Why are you frowning? Because <laughs> I'm so hard on I'm so hard on her in the book. I, even reading that out just now, I thought, my God, like we're saying that saying that she can, didn't have female friendship, but that actually is is wrong. You know, she had a really interesting friendship with Ruth Fain. Like she was 30 when she died. Who knows what sort of thing she would have done? Like the the, the judgment I lay on myself, I don't think is okay, but. It's just such an incredible, like such an in, intense life, like so many wrong turns, so many right turns, so many, um, and the writing is just beautiful. Like, um, it has the only poems that I have memorized, you know. And someone, someone says it's, she's written in a tantrum of style or something. That's really <laughs> true. Um, go on then. You want me to say mine? Yeah. <laughs> Virginia. Of course. Love her. I've always, but it's also just like, did I, is it because I read it when I was very impressionable when I was 20 years old? I read the whole, all of it, except Orlando. Mm -hmm. um, oh, why'd you leave that out? What? It just wasn't on the, wasn't on the syllabus. <laughs> <laughs> I was saving, I was saving it. Um, <laughs> uh, so you still have to have some left, right? Yeah, you do. Um, I don't know. I think like the depth of feeling, but also the sort of like balance of critique and and I just it's just great. Do I have mm. to explain? Just, no, no, no. But you are explaining best. it well. Did you read the letters and journals and things? Mm -hmm. that time too? Yeah, I mean, I didn't read the whole biography, but the letters and journals are like very important and the short stories, amazing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think people should read more of the short fiction actually. Um, the essays always 
fantastic. Very, she's funny as well. I think she doesn't get a lot of credit for being funny um, mm. because she's so morose. But I also think you you write too about uh, how she's taught as like a difficult writer, mm -hmm. um, and then you came back and you were like. It's, not that it's actually, it's, it's difficult if you're 20, which is why you shouldn't read anything before you're, 20, <laughs> before you're 25. But you sort of should, right? Because I guess there's so many writers in this book that I w I've been scared of approaching and scared of writing about. I think I was told you when I was starting the Wolf chapters, like, I cannot write about Wolf. Who do I think I am to write about Wolf? Like, there's so many people who've done it. And, but she does let you in in these weird ways. And I think maybe you have to go if you if you read everything that you think you could handle before opening the book, then where would you be? Um, you just can't get anywhere. Um, Christine, I'm sorry, but at least you passed. We took as long as we could. No, I'm not doing it. I don't do favorites. But I have other questions about the book. Um, um, you can you know answer these or take them in a different direction. But I'd love to know um, what models you had. You know, like what were there books? That already existed that you looked to that you want to be kind of considered alongside or and um, if there's something really surprising you turned up in your research or writing or thinking that would be fun for us to hear yeah um surprising things were more just again it was my judgments that i had to like revise yeah. so i knew from um that great book of Phyllis Rose's about Victorian marriages about Lewis and George Eliot and their like amazing partnership but I didn't really know that she had like tried to go out with Herbert Spencer before and it hadn't worked out yeah. <laughs> so maybe I'd forgotten it she, maybe she says it and I've forgotten it but I was like oh it was sort of second choice <laughs> um but it worked out it was the right thing um and models I you know I've read it's weird, I suppose it's in the book, right? So I'm kind of like trying in some ways to reach towards some of these people. Um, I read Seduction of Betrayal when I was working on this book. I read a little bit of Didion, reread Jack and Rose's stuff, reread. And so I, was, I wasn't trying to kind of copy a new one because like, um, I found that too intimidating, but I did think about different ways of having essays and ways that um, writers could talk to each other. Um, yeah. Do you find that your work as an editor um, helps you think about your own writing, or does it is it like a completely different part of your mind? That you, I think some people are like, oh, when you write, you have to turn off your editing brain because otherwise you'll never be able to put down a sentence. Yeah, um, people have said that to me too. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I was thinking about this and thinking about whether, because um, it's kind of weird for me to be up here, sort of in, sort of in the center, as as opposed to on the side or behind someone or having done something before, and um, it's sort of a trip and it's, it's sort of exciting and weird. But it made me think about what I really value in my editing is really bringing out someone's qualities as a writer and thinking about what's the best combination of X and Y when I. You know, I said to Sally, Sally Rooney, you should write about Sheila Hetty, like being really excited about the combination and making that kind of work. Um, when I realized I could send Lauren and the Goop Cruise, that was an exciting moment of thinking like someone's talents and what, what that might offer them, what Harper's does with its tradition of you know, David Foster Wallace and everything that that could, could be in play, that makes me really excited. So it's almost like a, um, it's like a little bit of friendship, I suppose, to kind of, see someone's qualities and try and bring it out. And, um, and I learn a lot. Like I felt working with you on that piece, I learned a lot myself. And um, hopefully it means that, sometimes I say to writers when I'm trying to sell myself as an editor <laughs> to them that oh, don't worry, I write, so I'm not gonna rewrite you. I've got my own way of doing things, it's okay. And I do sort of think like that maybe they're quite, um, they're quite parallel, that you can work quite well together as opposed to being in conflict. Yeah, well, I think you said something to me when we were talking about when I'd been on the cruise, but I hadn't really started writing, and I was nervous about like some incident that I was like, I don't know how we'll fact check this or something. I was like nervous about something, and you were, you just said, and I'll never forget this because no editor has ever said this to me, <laughs> and they probably won't. Uh, 
just write the piece you want to write and we'll figure out how to publish it. <laughs> and like, that is such a rare quality in magazine editing. Um, and like, it also, I think reading this book, it made total sense to me because you really value freedom and you really think it's sort of integral and like totally important to producing great work. And I agree. Um, and I think like I can get very frustrated being edited by magazine editors sometimes. Um, but I've worked with Joe for five years. Uh, also edited um, another uh, quite viral article I wrote once about another woman writer. Um, and <laughs> and um, like it's always like it's just so such a pleasure to work with you because you're not like you don't have an agenda because you have your own. You have your own thing to do. You can do your agenda on your own byline, right? Um, which is really nice. Sorry, just, that's a comment, more, more of a comment than a question. <laughs> <laughs> My God, I thought we were going to get through this. Yeah. Um, well, we can do that because of the magazine, because of all my the fact checking is incredible, and all the my colleagues that know so much about. So we, it's like a kind of I do feel confident in saying to a writer, "Go for it. We will be here. We will work out a way of doing it." Um, it's also how fun of our lives a bit sometimes. My friends ask me for advice and I'm like, well, go for it. We'll sort it out when you're, when you're done. <laughs> Text him, it's fine. <laughs> we'll work it out. You should always text him. Except, oh. except not more than twice in a row. This feels like a moment to turn to audience. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah, text, just add it in the end. Should I text him? To the yeah. End? Yeah, so. <laughs> How does this work? Um, so if you have a question, you can raise your hand, and we'll come over to you with a microphone, and you can ask your question. And if you're on the uh, live stream, you can also put your question into the chat. Um, yeah, I was curious about, when you're writing about, um, how you handle the kind of scholarship around these women, especially when it's contested. I think with Sylvia Plath, you have like dueling biographers. And obviously with Elena Ferrante, you know, don't spoil anything, but her identity is ambiguous. Um, how, so how did you handle that when the kind of factual scholarship was not always perfectly clear? And then how you, because you're using that to kind of take off for the rest of the stuff. Hmm. Oh, Plath is a good example of that. I, I um I just a bit of a plath nerd when I was younger, so I sort of knew my way through it. Um, I mentioned in this reading about um, Ted Hughes changing the order and taking things out of burial. Um, we are very lucky in the Scoff Path Scholarship because Frida Hughes stepped in and made a new version of burial, according to her mother's original manuscript. And it's a really beautiful book, and hopefully they have it here. It's the first half is the exact facsimile pictures of the typewritten manuscript. And then the rest is a kind of modern version of it. And to have Frida Hughes, her daughter, sort of do that is a kind of a special book. Um, and the letters have been really well edited. We've been quite, because of the tangle with Plath at the beginning, obviously Jacqueline Rose's book is so wonderful on that. Um, the latest scholarship has been really excellent. Um, Peter Steinberg and Karen Kukul have done great editions, and I trust them. And I, you know. I've also gone into the, like, the deeper parts of the Plath kind of marginalia. There was um, my old boss at the LRB once brought in the a kind of, it's a kind of rare book. It's this kind of early edition. It was a memoir written by the doctor who lived below or above Plath. I should know that. Um, the In the, her last flat. And it's this kind of um, extraordinary and weird and cool little book. Um, so I, you know, I've done my, due diligence, but I felt very, um, I'm enough of a nerd to feel kind of, could swim through that with understanding it, yeah, after doing all that reading. Do you have any advice for writers who start as editors? Um, It's the same advice you would be for a writer, I think. Just read, um, just read, and you know, try things out, and you know, that's all, really all you, all you can do. Do you two have a, a, advice? What do you get when people say how to start? 
Advice? Advice for people. Don't give advice. <laughs> <laughs> I think advice is a dangerous thing to give. <laughs> this is just autobiography, you know, it's not mm. really helpful to anyone else. Yeah, my advice is like, it depends. Well, your advice is to text people. Don't text you? people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, well, texting people is a huge part of my process. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm not joking. Like, it's, it's horrible. And people are like, aren't you supposed to be writing? I'm like, I am writing my text messages. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I mean, my advice is always like, it, depend it depends. Like, what is it that you want to write? What have you done before? How much money do you have? Do you have a rich husband? Like, do you have, like, rich parents? <coughs> like, like, <coughs> have you humiliated yourself on the internet and you need to scrub your Google result? Like, you know what I mean? It's just, it really depends. <laughs> it really depends. But as advice goes, yeah. to read widely is kind yeah. of fantastic advice for any any problem you might be facing. Yeah, I thought that was pretty uncontroversial. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe well done. Wrong. Well done. Is there anybody else who has a question? Um, I probably shouldn't ask this, as it is, it is also um, in terms of advice, but more along the lines of what advice or recommendation do all of you have for young women writers looking to write um, essays in creative nonfiction? Um, yeah, without it feeling like, or I guess standing strong against criticisms of it being too much like navel gazing um, instead of like real narrative writing arts. Sorry, I'm nervous to ask this question. Did it make sense? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool. that's a good question. Um, why? Well, I just hope that we've made a bit of space for you to make a mistake. I mean, that is the thing, that you try things out, you write pieces that you don't like, you learn, you try something else. Like, the point isn't to be a finished product already, I think. Um, yeah, it's so, I mean, the internet has made it so impossible for yeah. younger people, I think. I mean, I think that we, our first pieces were probably not published on the internet, and there was a lot more freedom in that. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, you could, Google me deeply and find some bad, like all my stuff, I think my college newspaper articles are on the internet and stuff. Um, it would be unethical of you to look them up. Uh, <laughs> <I> never, <laughs> <laughs> um, but like you can't be too careful because if you're constantly afraid of what people are going to say about you, it's just about knowing what kind of criticism to take seriously and what, what part of criticism to pay attention to and what part to ignore, right? Like, mm -hmm. people are always going to say you're navel-gazing. Like, some go like guys on Twitter are like, oh, you wrote this 10,000-word article about your boyfriends. So you don't even write about Gwyneth Paltrow. And I'm like, you don't understand. There's nothing to say about You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't really matter. You just, like, you develop your own sort of set of values and principles and like figure out what it is you want to say and why is it you want to say it like I think for me a rule that I have um, is like if it can be construed as bragging you should take it out um, and if like you're just doing a therapy session you shouldn't do that um, you should, you should do it. You, you should, should do it. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You should do that in private. Um, but yeah, it just again, it just depends. I don't know. I wouldn't be too afraid of like publishing things on the internet because there's also so many more places you can publish. You're not going to get paid, but I didn't. I mean, you're not going to get paid very well. Um, but I got paid zero dollars for my this huge thing that like got me a job you know what I mean so it's just about like can you get money else I, we don't need to talk about money a room of one's own uh, we all know we all know about that um. <laughs> but I think what Lawrence has about choosing your influence as well like try and work with people you admire try and work with good editors try and you know we talked about at the beginning like picking writers that I was going to include in this book, I tried to, the, what I didn't say um, is that I just chose people whose writing I thought was really good. Um, I didn't, that was almost like the first criteria and I think that's, might be quite important if you're starting out, like choosing the classics, choosing things that are really good um, and surrounding yourself with that. We have time for one more question. Uh, 
Um, how um, uh, brutally honest do you think you were when you were telling your side of the story in terms of the fact, you know, that old saying, never let the truth get in the way of a good story, in terms of you wanting to make your writing or your side of the story perhaps competitively compelling as the one you were writing with, against? I mean, was there a dance back and forth between honesty, like brutal honesty, and embellishment of some kind in terms of your side of it, you know? Um, I um, I value honestly and I, honesty, and I did try and be honest. And I um, people I've shown it to. I, you know, if I've made if I made if I've misremembered things, then they corrected me. Um, I think it's very difficult to write to be brutally honest. I, I think I'm not. I don't think that. Um, I played a lot with the later drafts of putting, taking certain things out and certain things in, and not because the criteria then wasn't sort of honesty or not. It was more like, am I getting in the way of the essay? Like, is it is this contributing to it? Um, so yeah, I think I've been honest. I can go to my grave feeling I'm being honest. I think. Let me add one tiny question, which is like, what was the most difficult thing to be honest about? Um, Writing about the, um, my mother's final weeks, I still, I hadn't stopped crying ever since I reread that passage. It was really hard to read that to capture it well. Um, and it was more like that, like trying to do justice to her, like she isn't famous, I haven't put her name in the book, like no one will remember her in however many years time, like, but it mattered to me that there was a tiny part of the book that was truthful about that. Um, yeah. I didn't read it tonight, it would have been a bad opening. <laughs> Me in tears for the rest of the event. <laughs> when you start crying, then it's like where, you know, you just go deeper and deeper and deeper. Yeah, really maybe it would have been better. I mean, we can do it all over again. Have we got time? <laughs> all right, well, I guess that we just say thank you now. Yeah, so thank you so thank much. Thank you, Joanna. Thank, thank you so much.